Welcome to Act in Line, the podcast of the Act in Institute for the Study of Religion and Liberty. I'm Caroline Roberts, producer and host. On this episode, we wanted to honor the memory of Gertrude Himmelfarb, who passed away last Monday, December 30th. Gertrude Himmelfarb was a historian and leading intellectual voice in conservatism. Throughout her career, she wrote many books about Victorian history, morality, and contemporary culture. In a tribute to her work, the New York Post named her one of America's greatest minds, and the National Review called her the paragon of intellectual accomplishment. So what did her work contribute to the conservative movement, and how does her view of history inform us today? Yuval Levin joins us on this episode to talk about her work in Legacy. He's a resident scholar and the director of Social, Cultural, and Constitutional Studies at AEI, and is also the founding editor of National Affairs. To read more about Gertrude's work and check out all of the articles mentioned in this episode, I have linked all of the resources for you in the show notes, and you can read those at blog.acton.org. That's blog.acton, A-C-T-O-N dot O-R-G. Welcome. My name is Dan Huger, Librarian and Research Associate at the Acton Institute. Today, my guest is Yuval Levin, Resident Scholar and Director of Social, Cultural, and Constitutional Studies at the American Enterprise Institute and the founding editor of National Affairs. He is the author of numerous books, including most recently, The Fractured Republic, Renewing America's Social Contract in an Age of Individualism, as well as the soon-to-be-released A Time to Build, From Family and Community to Congress and the Campus, How Recommitting to Our Institutions Can Revive the American Dream. Yuval and I will be discussing the life and legacy of Gertrude Himmelfarb, who passed away recently at the age of 97. A historian and moralist, Himmelfarb authored many books on great Victorian luminaries, from the scientist Charles Darwin to the novelist George Eliot. She was one of those rare thinkers and writers who were the total package, prolific, scholarly, and an eminent practitioner of the writing craft itself. Yuval, welcome to Act in Line, and thank you for speaking with us. Thanks very much for having me. You wrote a wonderful and quite comprehensive survey of the life and work of Gertrude Himmelfarb for the National Review titled The Historian is Moralist. But I'd like to begin with a brief sort of thumbnail sketch of the woman herself to orient our listening audience. Just who was Gertrude Himmelfarb? Well, Gertrude Himmelfarb was a historian, a historian of especially 19th century Britain. She was an American. She was born in 1922 in Brooklyn uh, and grew up uh, in, a, in, in an observant Jewish family in Brooklyn, um, intellectually serious and, uh, and, and politically engaged. Um, as a teenager, she went to Brooklyn College and got involved in, at the time, uh, left-wing political activism, through which she met her husband, Irving Kristol, who, of course, himself has, uh, went on to become quite a renowned intellectual. Um, she got her Ph.D. at the University of Chicago and uh, worked there on the thought of Lord Acton. Um, that uh, dissertation became her first great book, Lord Acton, A Study in Conscience and Politics, and from there, she became, over time, really one of the most prominent American scholars of the history of the Victorian era in Britain, and also engaged in a lot of the political and moral debates of the day. She, uh, like her husband, Irving Kristol, moved to the right over time, and she became a very important figure in helping the American right think about the place of morality in public life and think about poverty uh, and the place of compassion in our policy debates. Um, she ended up being an extraordinarily influential thinker, uh, the author of 16 books and countless essays over the years, uh, and really left an indelible mark um, on our intellectual life. Yeah, absolutely. She is just amazingly prolific. Um, what was Himmelfarb's vision of, of sort of the task of historical scholarship, and how did she view her vocation as a historian? It's an interesting thing, you know, and it develops over time. One of the striking things about her work is how much of it is devoted to thinking explicitly about the question of what a historian's role is. And that's in part because she began as a scholar of Lord Acton, who, of course, himself was a great historian and also one who thought hard about just what the purpose of the work of the historian is. And she 
came to think over time that an important part of her task was to combat a tendency in, within her own profession to uh, approach history in uh, as a sense as a place to learn how much better the present is than the past, or the way that she would describe it is that a lot of historians came to think that their purpose in interpreting the past was to impose the values of an enlightened present on a benighted past. Her own approach, she described it really in some of her work as a kind of temptation, was to do something like the opposite, was to learn from the past what the present had forgotten. Uh, her phrase, and a wonderful way to think about what a historian does, she thought that there were lessons for us in the ways in which prior generations dealt with problems that were like our problems. And so in a sense, she did search for contemporary meaning in the past, but by assuming that uh, past generations have something to teach us rather than just something to learn from us. So the, the, the historical task is then one of sort of recovery and, and resourcement to address contemporary issues. Um, what was interesting is your account of the dominant, the dominant strain of historical thinking is actually very similar to Lord Acton himself, his, his, his view of, of the historian as a judge. Um, and, that's, and that's something that, that, that Himmelfarb took a more sort of value-free attitude towards. Yes, I think that's right. Uh, and, and again, looked for ways in which it was possible for us to learn from the past. That's not to say she was an antiquarian, and it's not to say that she thought that history had been a march of decline. I think in this sense, she did learn from Acton, who, who takes history to be uh, a kind of tally of wins and losses. It doesn't move in one direction. And this was certainly her view. There were ways in which things had improved dramatically um, over time, and there were ways in which we had lost our way some and might be able to learn something from the study of history about how to do better. And she was intent on bringing both to bear, and as you say, uh, on, on approaching the past uh, as it was. Now, as a historian, she focused largely on the Victorians, figures like Lord Acton, Charles Darwin, and John Stuart Mill. What did she see in them, um, and what did she see in that particular time and place of, of Victorian England that so captivated her? Yeah, it's a great question. You know, in one sense, it's a, it's a kind of a mystery of what this this uh, this woman who had grown up in Brooklyn uh, in the 1920s and 30s would find in the Victorians. But I think that there were a couple of things above all. She thought that the Victorians dealt with a problem that, that remained relevant and maybe was intensely relevant in her own time, which was the problem of how free society can, can prevent itself from falling into an idea of, of personal liberty that would overwhelm every other priority and especially would overwhelm moral priorities in its political life. And she thought the Victorians had, had confronted this problem and it dealt with this problem by a kind of moralization of their political life, an insistence on moral priorities alongside their belief in the importance of liberty uh, and individual freedom. And so one thing that really interested her about that period was the way in which the Victorians had been able to inject moral priorities, religious priorities, drawn from a period of a kind of moral awakening in British public life, uh, in order to uh, uh, infuse their politics with a sense of more than simply liberal, but nonetheless always liberal um, priorities and ideas. She was also interested in the Victorians because they, th their uh, intellectual life was very rich and was full of fascinating characters and figures. Um, and they really believed in the importance of the work that intellectuals did. And this was always a priority for her as well. She uh, lived and worked among the, 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 that great generation of mid-20th century New York intellectuals. She and her husband were among them. Her friends were. And she found in the Victorians an example of how intellectuals could contribute to a society's moral and political life that she thought uh, could be very valuable in her own time. Yeah, that's a that's a fascinating distinction, and and one that the one that often gets overlooked when you look at a lot of those nineteenth century figures. Um, you know, Lord Acton himself famously said uh, that liberty is the highest political end, and oftentimes people overlook the fact that Acton also makes a distinction between society and the state, and that uh, to be committed to liberty as a political project does not mean that, that liberty is the, is the overwhelming and overriding value above all other human values or institutions. 
Yeah, that's right. And it really comes across in her own work on Acton, that she appreciated the way in which he thought about liberty as making room for other priorities. That is, liberty is, a, is, a, is the highest political end because it prevents politics from overwhelming the other ends of moral life. Um, and it leaves room for religion. It leaves room uh, for serious thought and work on the state of society and its institutions. Uh, it, it, it is uh, uh, the highest political end, and yet not simply an end in itself. Um, it served the purpose of enabling a flourishing moral life. And that's something that she really draws, you know, her work on Acton, she did in her 20s, and it absolutely shaped the the way in which she thought about every uh, historical and political question after that. Yeah, that that first book about Lord Acton, uh, Lord Acton, a study in conscious and politics, um, we actually at the Acton Institute brought that back into print um, back in, oh, let me see. I've got a copy right here in front of me. It looks like, yes, in 2015. And that was that was actually my first editorial project on a publication was uh, – was getting the permission from her and and doing the retype setting, and it really is sort of a hermeneutical key to 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 Himmelfarb's larger project. Um, now we've talked about this this sort of instilling uh, this tension, this paradox of liberalism between um, you know liberty as an end. But then this this strong moral character that the Victorians uh, brought to it, and the, the title of your essay was also uh, a very famous title of a work of, of Gertrude Himmelfarb's herself, uh, the historian is moralist. Yeah. Now, what exactly is a moralist, and how did Lord Acton serve as a model for for her own sort of moralism? Yeah, it's an interesting question. So the the historian is more or less is the title of an essay that she wrote about Acton uh, later. So her book about Acton, um, it, 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 as I say, was originally her dissertation. It was published uh, in 1950 as a uh, in 1952 as a as a book. And uh, later, toward the end of the 60s, she writes again about Acton um, as a moralist. And in part, what she was doing in that essay and what she uh, did otherwise in those years is trying to recover the idea of a moralist um, as a as as a, as a pivotal figure in the intellectual life of a free society. A moralist, you know, we now hear that word and we think of it in almost ironic terms, as if a moralist is a scold, is someone who only pretends to the moral high ground um, in order to preach at others. Himmelfarb wanted us to see the potential of moralism as a force for good in the life of a free society, as someone who truly reminds that society of its own moral priorities and imperatives, as someone who embodies a certain way of engaging in public life that takes those moral premises seriously. She thought that there was real room for someone to make an argument that tries to get people to behave better and to treat the the, the stated, articulated moral priorities of their society as, in fact, uh, a way of being as a public figure. And she, she saw an act in someone who tried to do that in different ways in different parts of his career. She certainly was not uh, an uncritical observer of Lord Acton. She had uh, objections to some of the ways he carried himself at different points in his career. But she, she thought that he took these moral questions seriously as practical questions, and that this was something our society needed, too, to understand that ultimately politics is necessarily infused with moral questions, that these are the prior, the essential questions, and that a historian has a way of offering a society its own story that puts those questions first and allows citizens in contemporary life to learn from um, from what their their predecessors got right and wrong on that front. Um, and so she really, I think, was trying to recover a way of doing history that she thought was uh, was characteristic of some of Acton's work. What's the relationship between this phenomena of, of moralism and religion as both individual faith and practice and sort of in, in, its, in its institutional forms uh, as well, in, in churches, in synagogues, um, in public life? So I, I think in this sense, Himmelfarb uh, took something both from Acton and from Alexis de Tocqueville, um, whom Acton agreed with in many respects, but also disagreed with in some, um, and, and thought 
of religion um, uh, in the in the in the in res- with respect to how it functions in society as among other things a way of lifting people's eyes above the everyday above the personal to larger questions of moral significance and so that her idea of moralism is very much grounded in the place of religion in public life she thought that the kind of moralization that the victorians had achieved really began with with wesleyanism with methodism um, that the Victorian age was defined by the ethic of, of Methodism, that the Catholic response to that in Britain had been very constructive and had been another way of thinking about how, uh, how moral ideals can shape public life, and that there was room for that kind of recovery and revitalization or awakening in American public life in the 1950s and 60s and 70s when she was writing on these questions. Um, and so, you know, Himmelfarb is never particularly open about her, her own religious life and her writing, but she certainly thinks that religion is an absolutely essential facet of the moral life of a free society. Yeah. Now, and she's also, um, one, one of the things, I mean, a lot of the questions we're talking about, she's, she's very good at delving into um, in that Lord Act and his study in conscience and politics. And the only thing that I that I would hesitate um, to recommend it as a one stop shop rather as rather than the best place to begin is there's there's less discussion of although there is some of Acton's sort of personal piety and theological commitment she very much focuses on this on this general moral vision and one of, one of the fascinating things about all of her work is that it's centered on individual subjects, individual persons. And she was a master of biography. Why, why this focus on individuals as opposed to ideas, institutions? Yeah, it's a great question. You know, I think at some level it has to do with her interest in intellectuals and in the work of intellectual communities. She was fascinated by the way in which thinking and scholarship can come to have an influence on on politics and culture and society. And she took that up by way of trying to think about how influential intellectuals uh, had done what they did. The Victorian age offers a lot of them to study, and she was fascinated by them as figures. And almost all of the historical writing she does, not quite all, she's got uh, some work on the ethic of the Victorian age. She has a wonderful book on the three enlightenments, which isn't quite as uh, as biographical as uh, the rest of her work. But most of her historical work is biography, short biographical essays, also three quite long um, individual biographies, one of Acton, as we said, one of Charles Darwin, and one of, um, of Mill, uh, John Stuart Mill. And she was fascinated by the way in which people's um, people's individual lives and work could interact with the larger life of their society. That was certainly one of her big questions. I think one of the great contradictions of Lord Acton's life that she does a great job drawing out in, the, in her biography of him is the fact that Acton was committed to be a historian of ideas, and he thought ideas are the motive force in history. And yet, the way that he lives his life, founding magazines, getting involved in politics, uh, in both the state and the church, and um, and the sort of personal relationship he forges with Prime Minister Gladstone, um, all, all sort of take away from his grand historical project. Um, Ignaz von Dollinger, uh, Acton's great teacher, once remarked that Acton would not, if Acton didn't finish a great book by the time he was 30, he would, he would never do it because um, he saw he was committed to this sort of lively public debate. Um, and it's interesting that Himmelfarb there sort of takes, takes Acton's life as a model rather than, rather than his, his theoretical approach, which she in some ways rejects, I think. Yeah, I agree with that. That's a fascinating way to think about it. There is overhanging her book about Acton, this this unfinished project of his, the great book he had in mind, which she really believes he could have written, that he had the, the thought down, but that his life got in the way. And 
I think she wants to say that that's not a getting in the way, that his life was a great achievement and did enormous good for his society. Um, and she disagrees with him when he says that you should study uh, not, not the people, the men and women that make up our history, but get behind them to the ideas. Himmelfarb wants to say you can't really quite separate those things so well, and there's a lot to be learned about the ideas and the moral forces at play by thinking about people's lives. Um, in a way, you know, she thought that, he, that his life uh, was much more successful than he thought it was, because for Acton, there was always that unfinished project, which he never did complete. Um, Himmelfarb sees his life as a model, as, as having achieved something that offers uh, herself and many others a lot to learn from. Himmelfarb's own sort of historical scholarship and, and, and on the Victorians and her own sort of intellectual life, what has that inspired in, in the conservative movement uh, writ large uh, in the United States um, since her activities began in earnest in the, in the 1950s? Yeah, it's a great question. You know, I think that where she's had the most influence um, has to do with a, a set of themes she took up uh, toward the middle of her career, of a very long career of seven decades of historical writing, um, where she turned to the question of how the Victorians had been able to uh, empower the kind of moral renewal that they saw in their time. And she thought that it had a lot to do with an emphasis in their thinking and, and political work on the condition of the poor. Um, an emphasis that combined uh, a commitment to compassion in thinking about the situation of the poor with a commitment to personal responsibility, to work, to the obligation to abide by certain kinds of public morals, the things we identify with the Victorians um, kind of on the surface. And her view was that this combination offered a way to combat moral decline um, and also offered a way to actually help lift up the poor and provide opportunities for those who needed them. Um, I think that language, that vocabulary that she drew out of the Victorian experience turned out to be enormously influential on the American right. And every effort to, um, to focus the attention of our politics on the poor and those who need opportunities since about the mid-1970s when her own work took this turn um, has emphasized this combination of compassion and responsibility. So when you see conservatives talk about uh, addressing poverty by requiring work, when you see conservatives talk about addressing poverty by helping people rebuild families and communities, and especially when you see the term compassion and the concept at the center of conservative thinking about these things, as with compassionate conservatism in the early 2000s, um, but in some ways before and after in, in the work of people like Jack Kemp, um, the, the influence of Himmelfarb there, I think, is quite direct. It is really her work that actually provided that vocabulary that allowed conservatives to sh show the larger society the way in which what they were offering was more than just market economics, or maybe that market economics was more than it seemed, and that it offered a way uh, to inject moral language and ideas into the center of our political and social debates. Yeah. And there's a way in which that, that Victorian legacy informs even a larger part of our social discourse, um, even even outside of, of the American right, um, to, to be able to sort of view the poor as having some sort of agency themselves, that... Um, the notion that poverty is even a soluble problem rather than just a fact of life is something that's, that's, that's really transformative. Um, and you notice a lot in those, in those 19th century figures that there's, there's an actual depth to the thought of thinking through, yeah, poverty as, 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 as a problem and, and not merely just a, bare, uh, just a bare sort of brute fact that, uh, that has to be dealt with or suppressed or marginalized. Yeah, no, I think that's right. And, and a way of thinking about it in terms of human flourishing rather than in, in, in colder or more abstract kind of economic terms, um, I think that, that provides a very important counter to some tendencies in our, in our political vocabulary. Um, and her recovery of it, I do think, was enormously influential. Now, 
I I had only ever corresponded with Gertrude Himmelfarb during during the course of her life, and um, I had corresponded with her when I I was putting together an anthology called uh, Lord Acton Historical and Moral Essays, which was the title was informed by that essay that that is also the title of of, of your piece, the National Review, and the the sort of model of reconstruction is sort of based on on her notions of the major documents that she thought contributed to Acton's thought, uh, you know, unrealized project of the history of liberty. And when I was putting that together, um, I sent her an email. And uh, this was, I mean, she was in her 90s when I emailed her. And I had asked her um, if uh, she would, she would one, consider endorsing the volume, which she very graciously did. Um, and I also asked her if she would consider uh, writing a foreword. And, and it was at that moment that, that uh, she paid me one of the greatest compliments that anyone has ever paid, for me, <laughs> paid me in my life, which was uh, that she, she had very graciously declined and she said, I couldn't think of anything that I could add to your introduction. And, you know, that's, that's still something that I keep posted on the, on the side of my <laughs> cubicle up at the Acton Institute to sort of inspire me. Um, and it, she's just a very generous and gracious woman and, and working at the Acton Institute and, and, and delving into Lord Acton. Um, our work here is centered around and animated by a lot of those themes we've discussed earlier. How, how has Gertrude Himmelfarb's life and work shaped your own life and work, if you have any, any sort of personal reminiscences or any way that that's animated your, your professional work as, as a scholar and as, as a public intellectual? Well, I was, I was very privileged to get to know her a little bit um, over the course of the last 15 years or so in Washington. Um, she lived in Washington, and uh, I came to know her and, and her husband while he was still alive. He died in 2009. Um, and you know, I would say what always struck me about her was the 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 sheer sense of dignity that she radiated, combined with deep generosity of spirit. She was always looking for people of promise in the rising generation. She had a kind of teacher's interest in younger people to talk to and learn from. Um, I would, with with a colleague, I would uh, take her to lunch every few months for just about the last 10 years until the, the past year where her health declined some. And the, the, our intention was always to ask her about her life, to hear about the extraordinary people she had gotten to know. Um, but what always happened instead was that she would ask us some question about an event of the day or something she had read and the conversation would just uh, fly from there. And it always turned out that, although she rarely left her apartment in her 90s uh, when we were doing this, um, she read everything. She took an enormous interest in the intellectual life of contemporary America. Um, and she was curious in a way that, you know, you could forgive a person in, in her 90s uh, for uh, living in the past a little bit. Gertrude Himmelfarb, for all that she was a great historian, did not live in the past. She was very interested in the state and the direction of American life. Um, she was hopeful about America. She had the kind of perspective um, of someone who had seen this country go through genuinely uh, grim and difficult moments and come out of it stronger. Um, and she certainly thought that, that we would, uh, although there was a lot in the politics of the past few years that she found depressing. Um, she never lost her confidence that this country uh, has what it takes to renew itself. Um, and I, I always walked away from those conversations just enormously energized by this woman in her 90s who had such extraordinary uh, intellectual energy and curiosity. I think that is a, a, a wonderful, wonderful note to end on. Thank you so much for being with us, Yuval. Um, Thank you. And uh, thank you for, for such a fitting tribute uh, in your piece and uh, in speaking to us, to uh, Gertrude Himmelfarb. My great pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank you for listening today. If you want to reach our podcast team here at Acton, you can contact us at actonline at acton.org. And if you like this episode, please take a moment to leave us a rating and review on the Apple Podcast app. 